the 222 FIFA World Cup is Qatar. On Thursday, December 2nd, 2010, the 2022 World Cup was awarded to Qatar. At the time, Qatar was a country of just 1.4 million people and had never previously qualified for football's global flagship event. It was the first time the World Cup had been awarded to a Middle Eastern country, in line with FIFA's pledge to stage at least one major international tournament in the region before 2030. But many people still question why the World Cup had been awarded to a country with average summer temperatures of 110 degrees and only one existing stadium. And in the 12 years since, the Qatar World Cup has been subject to intense scrutiny, with the tournament even being moved to the winter for the first time in the event's history. So why was Qatar awarded the World Cup? And why is it now being played in the winter? How can a country of 2.8 million people have the infrastructure to host the world's biggest sporting event and accommodate over a million fans within the small peninsula? And what's so special about the new ball being used? Here's everything you need to know about the 2022 World Cup in Qatar. Before we get into this year's World Cup, it's helpful to have some background on Qatar itself. The country is located in the Middle East, occupying a small part of the Arabian Peninsula and shares its only border with Saudi Arabia. At 4,468 square miles, it's the 164th largest country in the world and smaller than 48 US states. In fact, you could fit 852 Qatars in the entire United States. In terms of its history, after being part of the Ottoman Empire in the 19th century, Qatar became a British protectorate in the early 1900s before gaining independence in 1971. Since that point, the country has used its vast resources and wealth to become one of the Arab world's emerging powers, exporting large quantities of oil and natural gas worth over $40 billion annually. The country still has the world's third largest proven natural gas reserves after only Russia and Iran, and the 13th largest oil reserves at an estimated 25 billion barrels. But aside from oil and natural gas, large global media groups like Al Jazeera and BN Sports are also headquartered in the country. And all this growth has resulted in a rapid population increase. Since 2006, Qatar's population has more than tripled, with over 2 million expats now living in the country, which makes Qataris a minority in their own country, at just 15% of the 2.8 million person population. Despite this, the country still has the fourth highest GDP per capita in the world, and it's looking to keep their status by diversifying the economy through the Qatar National Vision 2030 plan, a project established in 2008 to make the country an advanced society capable of sustaining its development and providing a high standard of living for its people. The country played host to the 2006 Asian Games, as well as the World Athletics Championships in 2019. But what's their football pedigree? And why did they get awarded the World Cup? Qatar's national football team has never qualified for a World Cup, but the country was awarded the tournament in 2010, ahead of rival bids from the United States, Australia, South Korea, and Japan. The pitch focused on giving the Arab world a chance to represent itself on a global level and grow football's existing regional popularity in the Middle East, not just the nation of Qatar. And the bid was also tied to the country's Qatar National Vision 2030 project, which would use sports as one of the country's catalysts for change. Others have also suggested that Qatar's lobbying efforts played a big role in their country being awarded the tournament. For instance, after the Confederation of African Football was strapped for funds, Qatar paid for its annual general meeting in early 2010 which opened up the opportunity for the country to present its 2022 World Cup bid to delegates that had votes on FIFA's executive committee. On top of this, Qatari Mohammed bin Haman was supposed to run for FIFA president in 2010, but pulled out months before the election to support incumbent president Sepp Blatter. Some news outlets saw this move by Haman as a means to garner support from Blatter for Qatar's 2022 World Cup bid. Then in 2013, former FIFA Secretary General Jerome Balki openly admitted the preference to work with less democratic states when organizing World Cup events. Balki said, Less democracy is sometimes better for organizing a World Cup. When you have a very strong head of state who can decide, as maybe Putin can do in 2018, that is easier for us organizers than a country such as Germany, where you have to negotiate at different levels. Valky has since been dismissed as FIFA Secretary General after allegations of corruption and wrongdoing within the organization came to light. And on paper, Qatar also simply outspent the competing nations in their bid. The country spent approximately $200 million on their pitch, nearly five times more than the nearest rival, Australia, and 40 times more than the United States. However, there have also been numerous accusations of bribery, financial foul play, and corruption. In 2011, former FIFA Vice President Jack Warner made public emails that claimed Qatar had bought the rights to win the bid. And in 2014, the Sunday Times reported that Mohammed bin Haman made payments totaling $5 million to football officials in return for their support for the Qatar bid. And five years after that, in 2019, the Sunday Times again reported that FIFA would receive an alleged $880 million in two installments from Al Jazeera pending a successful bid. Then most recently, in 2020, the US Department of Justice formally accused three South American officials of receiving bribes to ensure votes for Qatar. 
But regardless of why the country was awarded the tournament, the other obvious question is why it's being held in the winter. The World Cup has always been played in June and July, ever since its inception in 1930. But the 2022 World Cup will be the first ever to be held in November and December. The simple reason for the change? Heat. The average temperature in Qatar reaches 92 degrees at the end of April and 107 degrees in June and July. So after being awarded the tournament, it quickly became clear that a Summer World Cup would be infeasible and possibly dangerous for players and fans alike. Therefore, the decision was made to move the tournament in November and December when the average temperatures range from 70 to 76 degrees. But concerns about the heat also led organizers to build air conditioning systems into all eight stadiums. The cooling units will use solar energy technology that run fans designed to take in outside air, cool it in to lower the temperature, and purify it for spectators. The professor of mechanical engineering at Qatar University said, We are not just cooling the air, we're cleaning it, we're purifying the air for spectators. For example, people who have allergies won't have problems inside our stadiums. But obviously with the World Cup being played in the winter, there's also going to be a disruption to the standard schedules of many national leagues around the world, and many leagues have had to make adjustments as a result. The Premier League had to start its season a week earlier and will end its season a week later than normal, while Germany's top flight league, the Bundesliga, will take an extra month off to accommodate the World Cup schedule, which means that the league will have two months off from mid-November to mid-January. These changes to the top flight leagues are unprecedented, and many have raised concerns about the impact on player health and fitness, with the sheer volume of football being condensed into just one season. Liverpool manager Jurgen Klopp compared the situation to climate change and said that people talk about it, but no one acts. He said that there must be one meeting where they all talk to each other and the only subject should be the most important part of the game, the players. My problem is that as much as everyone knows it's not right, no one talks often enough about it and it won't be changed. Something has to change. The World Cup happens at the wrong moment for the wrong reasons. The next obvious question is where the games will be played. One of the unique facts about the upcoming tournament is the number of stadiums. There will only be eight stadiums in total, which is the lowest number of venues for a World Cup in recent years. In fact, of the eight venues selected to host the tournament, only one was built prior to the bid, while the other seven have been constructed from scratch. Given the size of the country, the maximum distance between two stadiums is also just 90 miles, with all grounds connected by the Doha Metro Line, which is expected to carry around 1 million people during the course of the tournament. These stadiums include the Lucelle Stadium, which is the tournament's flagship venue hosting the final. After the World Cup, larger parts of the stadium are going to be taken down, and the ground area will feature a community space with shops, leisure areas, and sports facilities. The next stadium is the Al Bayat Stadium, a name that is derived from Bayat al Shayir tents used by nomadic people in the region. After the tournament, upper seating will be removed and a five-star hotel and shopping center will go up in the space. Thirdly, we have Al Janoub Stadium, which is inspired by the sales of Doha boats. Then there's Ahmad bin Ali Stadium, where 80% of its construction materials were reused or recycled, and its glowing facade represents patterns that characterize different aspects of the country. The fifth stadium is Khalifa International Stadium, which is the only stadium that was built before the 2022 World Cup, and the only one that has no plans to be dismantled post-tournament. The sixth stadium, Education City Stadium, is located in the middle of several Qatari universities and known as the Diamond in the Desert. Its outside facade changes colors based on where the sun is in the sky, and after the World Cup, half of the seating will be removed. The penultimate stadium on the list is perhaps the most interesting. Stadium 974 has a unique appearance and derives its name from the 974 shipping containers used to construct it. The stadium will be completely dissembled after the World Cup, with the parts being reused as shipping containers and sent to other countries that need materials for their own sports facilities. Finally, we have the Al Thamama Stadium, which is named after a native tree and inspired by the gafia, an Arabic hat. After the World Cup, a hotel in Moose will open on the property. Given that seven of these stadiums have been built from scratch, the construction investment is substantial. Ever since Qatar was awarded the World Cup, the country has been developing infrastructure to accommodate an anticipated 1.5 million visitors, and that doesn't come cheap. The exact figure of how much has been spent on the World Cup varies depending on what's included. Some of the total cost estimates that include the stadium, infrastructure, and everything else built to accommodate 1.5 million fans are estimated at $220 billion. But the latest total to come from a Qatari official was around $200 billion. Regardless, Qatar is shattering the record of money spent on hosting a World Cup. This $200 billion plus figure accounts for approximately $6.5 billion to $10 billion on the new stadiums, and about $190 billion to $210 billion on long-term innovation projects that also fit the country's Vision 2030 plan, with infrastructure like hotels, underground transportation, and airports being built. And compared to all of the World Cup events held since 1994, Qatar 2022 will be nearly 14 times more expensive than the second most expensive World Cup on record, Brazil 2014. This spending is not without an expectation of return though. 
Qatar is expecting a $20 billion economic boost from hosting the world's most prestigious football tournament. And the World Cup is a key part of their national vision project for 2030, with much of the infrastructure being transformed post-tournament to fuel further diversification of the economy. But it's not just the national spending that is important for the economics of the event. Sponsors are also a key factor. Given that the World Cup reaches millions of people in more than 200 countries globally, it's seen as one of the most premier sports marketing events in the world. Nielsen even says that the World Cup generates the highest awareness of any sporting event in the world. FIFA has a number of commercial affiliates that sponsor all of their events, including Adidas, Coca-Cola, Wanda Group, Hyundai Kia, Visa, Qatar Airways, and Qatar Energy. And for this World Cup specifically, they've got other global brands like Budweiser, Baijus, Crypto.com, Hisense, and McDonald's all sponsoring the event too. In terms of the revenue this thing brings in, not all terms are reported or disclosed for FIFA sponsors, but 2015 estimates from Business Insider and BBC say FIFA receives about $180 million per year collectively from all its sponsors. However, the awarding of the World Cup to Qatar has not been without controversy. Some consumers have called on sponsors to speak out against Qatar. Budweiser, Adidas, Coca-Cola, and McDonald's have all made statements addressing the concerns, and Denmark's kit sponsor Hummel even designed a monochrome kit that camouflages its brand logo. So, what are these controversies, and why are fans concerned by sponsors endorsing the event? The main issues revolve around migrant workers and the rights of women and minority groups in the country. On migrant workers, according to some NGOs, the pressure to build quickly has led to the mistreatment and deaths of numerous migrant workers. In fact, Qatar has been repeatedly accused of human rights violations in regard to its treatment of workers building the 2022 World Cup stadiums and infrastructure. Amnesty International claimed that 90% of Qatar's workforce is migrant workers, 1.7 million people, with the main culprit of criticism for migrant working conditions being the kafala system, which requires migrant workers in Qatar to be monitored and controlled by their private citizen or employee sponsor, including visa and legal status. As a result, there have been accusations that construction workers in Qatar have been abused, denied their wages, and trapped in a system that they cannot escape from, which some have labeled as a de facto form of slavery. And there has been a dispute over the number of migrant workers who have died on these projects, with figures ranging from 7,000, according to the International Trade Union Confederation, to just three work-related fatalities and 39 non-work-related fatalities, according to the Qatari authorities. But whatever the exact figure is, World Cup organizers admitted in April 2022 that migrant workers were exploited by three companies with forced labor. And on top of the issues around migrant workers, concerns have also been raised around the rights of minority groups in Qatar and the lack of freedom of expression in the country, particularly in relation to women's rights and the rights of the LGBTQ plus population. Compared to other modern countries and world powers, Qatari women have fewer rights, and there's a stark imbalance compared to men. Under a guardianship system, women are required permission from a male guardian, a husband, father, brother, grandfather, or uncle, to do things like study abroad, work most government jobs, travel abroad for certain ages, and gain certain female reproductive care. And although women have the right to vote, there are only four women in the country's 45-member parliament. Similar issues are faced by LGBTQI people, who have very few rights in Qatar, where homosexuality is illegal. Per the government's Article 296, leading, instigating, or seducing a male in any way to commit sodomy or dissipation, and inducing or seducing a male or a female in any way to commit illegal or immoral actions, is considered a crime punishable by up to seven years in prison. And according to Human Rights Watch, Qatar has also censored references to sexual orientation and gender identity in the media. And there are accusations of internet surveillance and arrest of LGBTQI persons based on their internet activity. In response to these accusations, Qatari leaders have said that it will welcome LGBTQI visitors and allow them to fly rainbow flags during the games. But they have frequently fallen back on the phrase of respecting culture in response to many of these accusations. For instance, Amir of Qatar, Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad al Tanan said, we welcome everyone, but we also expect and want people to respect our culture. But what about the fans? And what measures have been put in place to accommodate the expected 1.5 million people descending on the country to support their teams? With a population of just 2.8 million, the influx of fans, officials, and teams is expected to inflate the population to over 4 million at points during the tournament. And while there are 69 hotels on FIFA's official hotel list, many fans have already raised concerns that they're unsurprisingly very expensive with limited availability. Back in March, for instance, there were only 30,000 hotel rooms in Qatar, and 80% had already been booked by FIFA officials and World Cup teams. As a result, organizers have had to create additional temporary accommodation for fans, which includes a mini tent city that can house up to 3,000 fans situated one hour outside of Doha, Fan Village Cabbage, which some news outlets have labeled glorified shipping containers, and finally, two cruise ships permanently docked in a brand new cruise terminal built specifically for the 2022 World Cup. 6,350 guests can stay on a 19-story boat which includes shops, restaurants, bars, gyms, and pools. Given the inflated prices in Qatar itself, some fans are opting to stay in neighboring countries like the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and Oman, 
with these countries offering shuttle flights for the tournament. And it's not just accommodation, which is expensive. Unsurprisingly, considering the cost of the tournament, the 2022 FIFA World Cup will have some of the highest ticket prices ever. The most expensive finals tickets will cost 5,850 Qatar Rials, or about $1,400, which is up 46% from the $926 for the 2018 final in Russia. Group matches will start at $67 for foreigners, and Qatari citizens will enjoy a discounted rate as low as $9 for group matches. One of the other commonly discussed issues has been the availability of alcohol. For many football fans, alcohol has become a key part of fan culture. But as a predominantly Muslim country, Qatar does not routinely serve alcohol. Only approved resorts and hotels are allowed to serve it based on permit-based status. And it's not routinely available at the scale and quantity that many fans might be used to experiencing in their native countries. Organizers have made some exceptions and alcohol will be available at select areas within stadiums, as well as the official fan zone, but it's not extensive. For example, alcohol won't be served in the desert tent city because the desert is considered a traditional place in Qatari culture. So although there won't be a complete ban, the experience won't quite be the same as previous tournaments and some have raised concerns that this could potentially cause problems off the pitch during the month-long tournament. But what about events on the pitch? What's actually happening? Who are the favorites? And why is the new ball from Adidas so special? 32 teams have qualified for the World Cup, and they've been split into eight groups of four. Each team will play the other nations in their group once, with the top two advancing to the knockout stages. After three knockout rounds, the final will be played at Lusail Stadium on Sunday, December 18th. So in total, there will be 64 games played across 29 days, with each of these games featuring the groundbreaking 2022 World Cup football. So what really is so special about the ball? Well, the Adidas 2022 World Cup ball, known as Al Rila, will be the first to feature connected ball technology. This means it will be connected to a sensor-driven VAR system that will be able to provide real-time tracking on offsides calls to video officials. This will allow for the most time-precise motion sensor ever to be used inside a World Cup official match ball, tracking every touch of the game. Combined with player position data and artificial intelligence, this connected ball technology contributes to FIFA semi-automated offsides technology and will provide instantaneous information to help optimize decision-making. Whether this means the World Cup will be without any on-field controversy remains to be seen. But even with this advanced tech, there's every likelihood VAR will have some sort of role to play at some point over the next four weeks of the tournament. Regardless of VAR controversies, there are no clear favorite countries to win the tournament. But Brazil, Argentina, and France are the three teams widely considered to be leading contenders for the title. France are the defending champions after winning the title in Russia in 2018. Argentina is coming into the tournament after winning the Copa America in 2021. And five-time champions Brazils are riding a wave of good form coming into the tournament as well. The tournament will also be Lionel Messi's last World Cup which could give Argentina added motivation to succeed. The same could be said for Cristiano Ronaldo in Portugal. The Portuguese playmaker turns 38 in February, and is unlikely to feature in any future national tournaments. So this could be the last time that we see both Messi and Ronaldo appearing in the same tournament for their respective countries. However, some major players aren't going to be there at all. Household names like Norwegian starlet Erling Haaland and Swedish stalwart Zlatan Ibrahimovic have all missed out, and other players including Diego Hoda, Angela Conti, and Gini Waldron have all picked up injuries and are likely to miss the tournament too. It remains to be seen how disruptive a mid-season tournament will be, and whether the controversy surrounding this year's World Cup will become more problematic for the organizers when the event actually starts. But there can be no question that the Qatar World Cup will be a unique event. With seven new stadiums, a purpose-built port for two 19-story cruise ships, and state-of-the-art stadium air conditioning systems, the event certainly hasn't come cheap. And now it's time to see whether it was all money well spent.